You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome to a special edition of This Week in Space. I'm talking this week about what might very well be the beginning of a new era in space. The door might have opened with the successful inaugural test flight of the Falcon 9 rocket built by SpaceX. It happened on Friday at Cape Canaveral. Now take a look. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Stage one. Lift off. We have MLS. Lift off of the Falcon 9. The nine Merlin engines fired as designed, producing more than a million pounds of thrust, sending Falcon 9 on its way to space. The first stage separated as it was supposed to, and the second stage rocket fired on schedule as well. The only apparent fly in the ointment. The second stage, along with a mock-up of the Dragon capsule, began a slow roll. No word on why just yet. SpaceX is leading the charge to open up low Earth orbit to private ventures seeking to create a new industry in space. It is a linchpin of the Obama space vision, and it remains a subject of a lot of controversy, even after this successful first flight. I caught up with SpaceX founder Elon Musk about 24 hours after the launch. <laughs> Elon Musk, thanks for being with us on This Week in Space. First of all, congratulations on that first flight. Um, obviously, as successful as you could have hoped for. Uh, you've had a little more time to look at the data. Tell us what went right and uh, to what extent things went wrong. Well, it, it, it achieved the homestead of the objectives that we set out beforehand, which was really to reach orbit. Um, you know, we were uh, not, not really, I mean, obviously, as I said before the flight, um, I, I thought there's only about a 70-80% chance of us reaching orbit. And then, of course, uh, statistically speaking, um, only about half or so of new launch vehicles reach orbit on their first attempt. So we were obviously dealing with those odds. And... Um, and at the end of the day, it would still have been a good day if we'd just gotten the first stage to function. But as, as it turned out, the, the whole, both first and second stage functioned really well. And uh, we made orbit and uh, to, to very high accuracy. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the, there were some minor things, like the, there was a bit more, a bit uh, more roll on the second stage um, than we anticipated. Um, but that's an easy thing to, to fix. It, it doesn't affect the um, orbit accuracy or anything like that. Give us some insight. We, talk, we talked a little bit about it in advance of the mission. But give us some insight on the kind of pressure your team was under. Were you, how worried were you about it? And now that, frankly, you've had this great success, you're worried that they might get overconfident. Huh. I don't think we'll get overconfident. Um, there's, there's no question. I mean, we were, we were very uh, nervous uh, on on this on this flight. Um, if people have put so much effort into making sure it would be successful, that uh, I mean, they'd really they were at the point where they they weren't just triple checking things; they were checking things for the fourth or fifth time. And um, I think at a certain point, you, you it actually gets boring to to be checking things for the you know fifth time. Um, and I actually think that's a good sign. <laughs> it's like when you when you've gotten bored with checking it for the sort of you check it so many times that you're getting bored, then then uh, then you can start to feel a little bit confident about the, the mission. And um, and so I think I think the team the team definitely went into into this mission um, with with the uh, belief that there was nothing more that they could do to ensure a reliable flight. Um, so if there's nothing more you can do, well. That's, you, that's it. You got to shoot. You got to fly. What um, your your detractors um, were left saying? Well, he may have done it, but it took him too long. He's behind schedule. What do you say to that? I mean, bad humbug. You know. I mean, really. <laughs> Some people have no grace. I would say that that there's for a lot of our our competitors in the commercial arena, they they actually have responded with grace, and they have. Uh, Said congratulatory notes. Um, there are a few people in the political arena who who actually put out attack press releases, which I think does not speak well of them as people. 
Tell us about how polarized this environment is, and that, that speaks to what you were just talking about. People on one side or another here are probably um, reading too much into things. Um, people who support you would look at this and say, hey, that, that, in, that is a full endorsement of, of Obama's course in space. Um, if, uh, if it had been a failure, people on the other side would have said, that's the end of the Obama space plan. Either way, that's, that's an overstatement. Put this into some kind of perspective for us. What, what did you actually pull off yesterday? I think, first of all, I, I, I actually don't think Obama's strategy for space um, need, needs, need, that needs the flight of Falcon 9 to be the right strategy. It, it is the right strategy because it's the only strategy that has any chance of working. Um, this, this idea of trying to keep the shuttle going forever is obviously ridiculous. Um, the, the whole Constellation program with the Ares, Ryan, and whatnot, uh, where you know, we would ha have to spend, I think the Congressional Budget Office or GAO uh, estimated $50 billion just to have something that has less capability than Falcon 9 and Dragon um, is, and would cost about $1.5 billion per mission. Is, is nonsense, um, and in order to, in order to afford Ares Ryan, we'd have to cancel the space station. We'd have to get rid of the, of some critical space and Earth science missions because uh, Constellation would eat up all the budget. So th that that path is is a ludicrous path, and I think um, some of the politicians that are, are pushing that path are being either willfully ignorant um, or they have some. I mean, I hate to say it, nefarious agenda. Like, what do you mean? Well, I'm, what I mean is, I don't think that they're acting in the best interest of the country. And, and you think they're acting purely to preserve jobs in their districts? Is that all we're talking about here? Or do they care about space exploration? Um, well, that's, see, the thing is that th there's really only one state that is, is going to suffer from the Obama uh, plan, um, and that's Utah. Uh, so I can completely understand if the Utah uh, senator or representative is uh, vehemently against the plan, uh, because even though it's the right thing for the country, it's the wrong thing for their state, that I can understand. But this is not the case for uh, Alabama. Of or for Texas. So, uh, in in the case of Alabama, you have Atlas V and Delta IV, which are manufactured in Alabama. And in the transition to commercial crew, the, the Atlas V and Delta IV will see a huge increase in business. Um, so, why would Senator Shelby uh, favor uh, Aries? which is made in Utah, over Atlas and Delta, which are made in his state. There are far more jobs to be gained for Alabama uh, by going with the president's plan uh, than, uh, of commercial crew than there are with uh, Aries. So it seems to me that he is uh, acting against the best interests of his own state. He is he's acting to reduce jobs in Alabama, not increase them. Moreover. Uh, another part of the president's plan has uh, a heavy lift of engine development. Um, and of course, a, a Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama is the, the NASA Center of Excellence for engine development. So there would be a, a big increase in jobs there as well for that, that heavy lift engine development. Uh, what lose is a handful of jobs that are, that are associated with managing a part of the Ares rocket development. That's it. Uh, so on net, with the president's plan, there would be an increase in jobs in Alabama. Why on earth from Alabama fighting for Utah? All right, let's, let's talk about one of the other things that comes up, and we're getting close to the end here. What, what, what people from the space old guard, for lack of a better term, say is, we're not ready for a commercial uh, space industry uh, run by the private sector. And what they use as a kind of case in point is that your business is built around uh, government contracts. Without government contracts, you probably wouldn't be in business. 
So if there is such a, a great business in all of this, there's so much money to be made, could you do it on your own without any federal help? Well, first of all, um, I've said on many occasions that this is not a great business. So I would certainly not be attempting to make the case that it is a great business if I've clearly said on many occasions that it is not a great business. Um, if, if, so, if, if all I cared about was making money, um, and I thought the best place to do that was the rocket business, I'd have to be insane. Um, it's, it's an incredibly difficult place to make money. It's, it's, I would have to rank as one of the, the hardest ways to make a buck uh, out of any industry. Um, however, the government, of course, is not the only customer here. And if you look at the, the SpaceX launch manifest, about half is, is, is government and about half is not. So certainly, uh, SpaceX could survive without any uh, government missions. Our business would be about half the size that it is, uh, but we could certainly survive without, without government missions. Um, over time, I expect that the, the, the commercial activity will increase relative to, to, to the government activity and we're probably closer to, you know, a 70% commercial, 30% government, uh, which is actually in line with the percentage of the economy that is government versus commercial. So that would make it really not unusual relative to any other industry. So there is a business here, one way or another, with or without. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and SpaceX has been profitable for three years, um, and we expect to be profitable again this year. Um, and like I said, half our missions are from uh, the U.S. government and half aren't. And if the, if the federal government pulled out and ended the COTS program and stopped the contracts, you would keep going? We would keep going. Obviously, we would, our, our pace would be a lot slower, but we would definitely keep going. All right. Final thought here. And um, uh, I, I don't want to get into your personal life, but there's a lot of stuff on the internet that you might be in some financial duress. Is there, is there any, the space community uh, is talking about some concern that SpaceX may not have the financial wherewithal to deliver. Can you assure us that you got the money to pull through and deliver on COTS? Yeah, I think this, this is an, an unfortunate piece that, uh, there, you know, there was something published by a Silicon Valley a, a writer who, by the name of Owen Thomas, who's basically Silicon Valley's equivalent of Jason Blair. Um, and, and, you know, like Jason Blair, he, he sort of mixes fact with fiction to create the most sort of salacious um, and, and, and interesting uh, stories. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that's sort of where all this, this comes from. Um, and and uh, it, it, it's true that for, on, on a cash basis, um, I don't have a lot of short short term cash in that um, I have you know had to borrow funds from from friends uh, to meet cash flow obligations particularly and primarily actually uh, the legal fees associated with the the lawsuit that my ex-wife has filed to break our our marital agreement <laughs> I'm not the aggressor in this situation um, so uh, I was faced with a choice there either um, I could sell a piece of SpaceX or Tesla or Solar City, um, or I could wait for a liquidity event um, to occur, such as you know a Tesla IPO or something like that. And uh, I thought rather than spend a lot of effort uh, selling a, a piece of one of the private companies, I just would wait until a Tesla IPO occurred, if it occurred, and and then um, that would address the liquidity issue. So SpaceX is so essentially I have a very high a very a very high net worth, just not not a high li liquid net worth. But if uh, there were, for example, an issue with SpaceX, uh, you know, some sort of funding issue, then I could sell even privately a, a portion of uh, Tesla or Solar City or something like that. However, uh, going back to what I said earlier, this is there's no need to do that. SpaceX is profitable and has been for three years. To just, just to button it up, you, you feel very confident SpaceX is solvent, making money, and, and you're, you're going to continue onward with the, the COTS contracts and whatever else follows. Yeah, I mean, despite the best efforts of, uh, you know, uh, you know, quote, these sort of uh, 
empire <laughs> of, uh, of the establishment uh, to prevent SpaceX from getting additional government contracts. Um, and even if they do prevent us from getting any further government contracts, SpaceX will be fine. Uh, it is not at this point dependent upon uh, my personal financial situation. Elon Musk, thank you for your time. And once again, congratulations on the launch. Thank you. Thanks to our sponsor, Binary Space. That's all the time we have for this special edition.